Welcome everyone to our panel discussion today. We're so happy to have you. My name is Amber Malinowski and I'll be one of the moderators here from Weave uh, this afternoon. And we're really excited to have this time to connect with each other. Uh, we know that there's a lot going on in the world right now and uh, a lot of you are working from home for the first time. Um, a lot of you are wondering what's going to be happening in accreditation and assessment coming up. And so we're really excited to be able to connect a little bit virtually today and share with you and have some of your colleagues um, really be able to kind of connect with you over this virtual platform. If this is one of your first Weave webinars, um, this is the Zoom webinar platform and there's a control panel at the bottom. If you're having any trouble with your audio, there is a little mic on the left and you'll be able to switch between phone and computer. If you need to send a chat, feel free to use that area. Um, my colleagues and I will be moderating that. So if you need any help, we can help get you unstuck. If you have a question, you can use that raise hand. You can also use the Q&A. That Q&A portion is really good for when we get to asking the presenters questions. So you can submit them there and the whole group can see so that people can um, see what kinds of questions are being asked. We don't have any polls today, uh, but normally we would do some of those. And if for any reason you need to leave, you can just go over to the right and leave the webinar. So we have a few different presenters today. I really enjoy doing these panels uh, because then we get a lot of different viewpoints. Again, my name is Amber Malinowski and I'm gonna let my colleagues, Brianne and Sherry, just say hi really quick so you can hear their voices as well. Hi, this is Sherry Pop. I know many of you through meeting at conferences or chatting in the listserv or the AALHE um, Slack channel, and it's a pleasure to be here today and learn from these folks about their accreditation journeys. I'm Brianne Billiette, and I'm the Marketing Database Specialist, and thank you all for joining us, and I'm excited for the discussion today, too. Sherry and Brianne were both very helpful in setting all of this up. Um, it's really a team effort on our end to make sure everything goes smoothly. So thank you to both of them. We really appreciate that. So we have um, David, Matt, and Joy with us today as well. And rather than me describe um, what they're up to and everything, I'll let them do that. I do want to just say quickly that we are recording the session. So if this is something you want to share with others later or there are people who registered that couldn't make it, we will be sending that out afterwards just so that you know. So without further ado, um, our first topic is to just have our panelists tell us a little bit about themselves. So I'm going to let them each take a moment to tell us a little bit about their institution and their role at their institution. And they each have a very interesting recent accreditation story that I'm hoping that they'll share with all of you. So if it's okay, David, I'm gonna pick on you first. <laughs> No problem. Hello, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining in on our webinar. Um, <clears throat> just to tell you a little bit about uh, myself and, and the college. I'm from Laredo College. We're about a 11,000 fall head count. About 40% of those are dual. Um, as far as our, our accreditation is concerned, um, we just finished our 10-year cycle. And, and I'll start with what happened t 10 years ago. Um, we were placed on probation for four IE standards. And it, even though the process started in 2009, it wasn't until 2013 that we've actually uh, cleared that out. Um, and uh, I, I took over the IE role just a, a little bit later in 2013, right after we had cleared uh, probation. And, um, you know, since then, uh, we, we've uh, had a, a bit more success. We, we submitted our fifth year report in 2015 with no recommendations. And uh, this last year in 2019, uh, we submitted our compliance certification and the level change application and we hosted a, a dual purpose committee in October and, and demonstrated compliance with all standards, uh, no recommendations. Um, it, it felt great at, at the time. Uh, it, felt, it feels even better now with uh, everything that's going on. I'm, I'm extremely happy that we were able to clear everything back in October. I'm clapping. <laughs> that is such a great story. Thank you so much. And uh, Matt, I think I'll have you go next if that's okay. Can 
Sorry, I was stuck on, on mute there for a moment. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, <clears throat> hi, my name is Matt Cardin, and as you can see, I'm from Ranger College, and I'm the VP over Accreditation and Institutional Effectiveness Matters, and I'm also our Institutional Accreditation Liaison to SACS COC, and um, I was uh, promoted into the position that I have now, being, being in charge of these matters for the college about two and a half years ago. And um, prior to that, and I've, I've been at the college almost six years now, but, but before I even was an employee of the college, at um, a previous uh, fifth year interim review on accreditation, uh, the college went on probation, largely for things relating to um, the current SACS standard 8.2.8, which is about student learning outcomes. But there were also uh, some other reasons. And then at their 10 year reaffirmation, they got that fixed. Well, when I was put into the position I'm in now, we, uh, the, the, the later that year, just nine months from the time I was made to what I am now, the fifth year interim report was due and it became apparent that it had been uh, horribly mismanaged, pretty much just left there. And suddenly it was like a four alarm emergency to try and figure out how we're going to do something in just a few months uh, that most places take a couple of years to do. And so through a really, really, really intense several months worth of internal research and drawing together teams of people and uh, a whole lot of writing and, and you know, a whole lot of uh, meetings and so on, we ended up um, hosting our on-site committee and uh, turning in a compliance certification where we were brutally honest about ourselves in, in, on both the good and the problematic. Turns out that we had fallen into uh, some disarray on some of the very things that had put us into uh, on probation status 10 years earlier. And the, the outcome actually was surprising after some back and forth over a few months with the commission we ended up with a clean bill of health, and uh, just next week, I have to submit the first of two annual monitoring reports. But it was interesting to see how the whole college came together, and I somehow, uh, with some other senior leadership, managed to make it be an opportunity to uh, do some reflection and really try and work some, some real substantial changes and improvements, not just in operations, but in the way we sort of regard institutional effectiveness and accreditation standards and that kind of thing. So it, kind of, it went from being a crisis, so it sort of morphed into an opportunity that I didn't at first know that it was going to be. But that's, the, that's kind of a happy ending to what could have been a, an unhappy story. I love that word opportunity. <laughs> that's a great way to describe some of these uh, things that could be a little bit tricky, right? Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And then Joy. Hey there, I'm Joy Rowe from Temple College, and our story is very similar to Ranger College's uh, in the fact that, um, and to Laredo's, we were on um, probation in our last uh, reaffirmation process. That was prior to me being at the college. Uh, they worked through that. They, um, you know, got our accreditation back on track, and then here we are, you know, 10 years later. Um, our leadership has changed. Um, when I came on board, um, I was hired as a, a data analyst and then it was sort of like, oh, and by the way, you're going to be doing assessment as well. Um, had no idea what was involved in all of that, but, um, you know, we've worked through the process and, and we were horribly, horribly behind for this reaffirmation process. Um, and that's really what our story is about is sort of getting back on track and then looking forward to not getting off track again making sure that you know five years from now ten years from now we are still where we're supposed to be so everything that i do now is really uh looking forward to that and our our compliance report has been submitted i don't know um how all of that wor will work out given our current situation um with isolation and all that but um we'll, we'll let you know but um I'm, I'm hoping for good results i think there will be some some recommendations but i also think that uh as Matt was saying, we, we will see where our weaknesses are and we can address those and make sure that we're not in this position again. I think there's definitely been a big shift in 
not just doing all this right before the accreditor shows up for sure. Um, right. but <laughs> it's so thankfully, but um, it's, it's a new shift though. I don't know that it's um, prevalent everywhere. So that's definitely something I think a lot of us can appreciate. And a lot of times that work's being done, but it's not being documented. And so that can be really, really right. tricky. I know Joy and I have had a lot of conversations about that. So um, thank you all so much. That, that was a perfect introduction. And I'm going to move on to our next topic. And I'd love to hear about one of your biggest accreditation or IE challenges or one of the biggest challenges in your story. And how did you overcome or how are you overcoming that? And um, this time I'm going to pick on Matt first. <laughs> Spice it up a little bit. Okay. I managed to get my microphone unmuted in a more efficient fashion, <laughs> that's too. Okay. So that's, that's a good sign. Uh, biggest accredited meditation challenge and uh, how we are overcoming it. Um, I found that uh, during the course of those hair raising nine months uh, that I was that I was leading up the fifth year interim report, which included our, our QEP impact report, which was a whole other story, uh, that I found that this, this metaphor came to me and I, I shared it with a bunch of people. Uh, I was working with faculty leaders and administrative leaders and directly with faculty members and people in various departments and so on. And I started telling them, you know, this just arose from my unconscious mind as the way to describe what is emerging from this self evaluation process uh, to describe how we are. Basically, I still told them the college was like a, a, a spaceship that had exploded in zero gravity out in space. So basically, it was still a cloud together, kind of shaped like a spaceship, and, and the force of just inertia was uh, keeping it kind of together. But in fact, the parts weren't connected. And in fact, it was sailing through space with the parts slowly spreading out, and pretty soon it was just going to look like a disconnected mass of junk. That's what came to me. And I think the, the biggest challenge was both uh, attitudinally for everyone involved and then just sort of technically and operationally uh, on, the, on the, the actual work part to try and gather evidence and make sense of things and diagnose what had happened and fix it. Uh, that sort of sense of disconnection was the worst because I don't know how it happened, but it ended up, in, it ended up giving us a situation where so many things were going on that in, in disconnected ways and communication wasn't happening and you would find that people didn't know things they should know about other areas of the college that they should right well know and uh, probably getting the full understanding of that picture and finding out what things we needed to do to bring it back together and what, what, what things we needed to implement to actually make it be a working machine. That was the, uh, that was the biggest challenge. And as I say, the, the education challenge to do, a, do an attitudinal flip on the part of the whole college community so that matters of accreditation can stop being viewed as just this sort of looming bugbear in the background that we don't want to think about for as long as we can uh, and make that instead become a thing where we just work the best practices represented by accreditation principles into how we work. That was, that was the challenge. And as far as overcoming it, well, I can just say briefly, because I took most of my time by saying that, um, doing some education of everybody and bringing in the right tools for which, and I'm not doing a pitch here for Weave, I'm just saying this is the actual fact, for which Weave uh, was essential because it gave us a central workplace everyone could contribute to. That was, that was the thing we did. We overcame it by bringing everyone together and giving each other the tools to actually continue doing work in a centralized place so we can all keep that big picture of you as we do our individual work. There's definitely um, a need to get everyone on the same page, literally and figuratively, right? First, we all have to agree that we're, we're going to do this and we're going to do it well and understand it. And then the actual tactical pieces of, of okay, now how are we going to actually execute on that? Another interesting thing that I heard you say, it made me think of a little bit of, of the medical field especially for, for people who might be kind of new to the role at their institution, where there's a time where you're kind of in 
diagnostic mode. So what has happened here? What is going on? What are the symptoms? Um, what do we need to treat? Um, and how, how are we going to do this together and make up a plan that's going to be successful for the institution and for the campus community? So I think there's it, that can be difficult to do when you're running up against a deadline, of course, or again, if you're new to this kind of work. So I, I liked hearing that you had to take the time to really look at those things. And um, I loved your, your uh, very visual analogy there in the beginning too. That was great. Um, Joy, would you mind speaking next? Of course not. Um, I would say that our, our biggest accreditation challenge was that we had an enormous change in, in leadership. Uh, I talked about that in my, my introduction and that is that um, literally our entire executive cabinet was new. And so we had a real lack of um, knowledge, I guess, to draw from. And so, and that, that was pretty much the whole team. So I went in as a, as a new person thinking that, oh, everyone else knows what they're doing and everyone else can answer these questions for me. And that was absolutely not true. There was no truth in that. Um, you know, you, you would ask a question about, you know, the, the assessment process and, and how were these done before? Oh, well, I don't know. The person who did that isn't here anymore. I don't know how they did that last time. And so I really felt like we were sort of reinventing the wheel. We were all starting from scratch. Um, and so every time we would talk about, well, you know, I, I sat in this meeting and this is, this is what they told us we need to include in, in our uh, compliance report. And this is what they said we need to do with the accreditation. You take that information, you go back, and then you end up having to research those things. So um, I hope that nobody's in that situation where all of their leadership has really turned over and they don't have any history to draw from, but that was really where we all were. And um, the thing that I have found the absolute most, most helpful is um, other than being organized and, and really organizing your task list is to network with people who are in your area. Um, I've, I always say that when we go to these conferences, one of the most valuable things that you'll get out of it is, is the networking aspect. You're going to find your people. You're going to find your tribe. Um, people who are dealing with the same thing or have dealt with the same thing and they have figured out how to work through that. And I, I have folks that I'm in touch with on a regular basis and I can reach out and say, this is a problem we're having. I don't really know how to resolve this. And sometimes they have differing opinions and I can draw from both of them. But um, a lot of times when you're on a small campus, if you're at a community college, you are the only person in your area. And it can feel very isolating in the fact that you feel like you have to invent this, you have to create the way to do this. And, and the truth of the matter is that there are all of these people out there who have probably done what you're trying to do. Um, so for me, that, that has been the absolute lifesaver because I'm not doing it by myself. Especially when you are kind of a one person office, which um, we've worked with a lot of those, those yeah. people in that position, it's really tricky. And if you're new to it on top of that, um, that can be really challenging. I think one of my favorite things when I was kind of new to this field was I, I really never felt like there was ever a sense of plagiarism. <laughs> Everyone right. was yeah, more than willing to, well, here, you can use mine and you can use this yes. or so-and-so has it and, yes. or go to this website. It's full of these things and they are meant to be shared and used. Yep. Um, but if you don't know that, especially since a lot of us obviously come from academia and we take plagiarism very seriously, right. <laughs> that can be kind of a shift, but this is a true community and seeing it people is, in person is always great too. There's a huge sense of collaboration between uh, our IE folks, just from college to college, they're all, they all want to help you. Mm -hmm. It's very sincere. And I think even when you go to sessions, that's really the message that people are, that's why they're there sharing, because they want to help somebody else the, that might be doing the same type of work that they are, for sure. Thanks, Joy. Um, and David? One of your biggest challenges and how you uh, overcame it. Well, when I first took over the role of uh, IE there at the college, um, I, I came from within the ranks. I was uh, the math department chair right before I became the IE director. But one of the first things I did was um, I, I talked to folks about what they felt about accreditation, about 
assessment uh, and weave uh, we had been using weave for a couple of years and and, and uh, how it was working and what was missing so fr from those conversations i had with uh, directors and chairs and uh, administration uh, I, I think the the biggest challenge was trying to create a sense of uh, shared responsibility for accreditation you know i think uh, before um, you know, I took over, I think the sense was that accreditation and assessment was something that the IE office did. And, and you know, all they had to do was press submit on a few documents and, and uh, we would take care of it from there. So um, there was a lot of <clears throat> feedback about, um, you know, whose responsibility it was about um, transparency. That was a, the, one of the other big topics I remember coming out of those conversations. So a lot of people, uh, so that you know, they didn't know what was going on with accreditation until it was uh, too late. So, you know, I, I did some of the basic things. You know, we we created a, a website for uh, accreditation. You know, posting timelines. It's a bit passive, but um, that that was one of the things that we did. We also, uh, you know, increased the frequency of emails and and you know, checking in on people, making sure that they were uh, doing what they were supposed to be doing, and 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 and. Uh, keeping up with their assessments. Uh, but I think probably the most effective one um, was we created uh, regular meetings with all the um, uh, program directors, uh, the directors in student services and finance and, and, um, and the department chairs. So we created what's uh, called IE Tuesday. It's, it's the last Tuesday of every month. Everybody has it on their calendar. And uh, our office spends um, literally the whole day um, meeting with every single director uh, on campus. And, and uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about, uh, at the beginning, trying to establish uh, a common uh, terminology about, uh, ass around assessment, you know, what, you know, basic stuff, like what's an outcome, what's a target, what's a measure. Um, and then, you know, as gradually as we moved closer to the accreditation, um, time uh, or the time to submit our compliance report we it became more about okay you know what do we have to do uh, to to get this done and and what are some of the responsibilities that chairs and, and directors have in accreditation and uh, you know slowly but surely uh, it, it became uh, apparent that a lot of people were were happy to to be involved and to know uh, some of the things that that had to get done and um, so that, that was probably the biggest uh, thing that we did to overcome uh, that challenge. And, and it was uh, very helpful, um, unlike some of the stories I, I heard from Joy. We had some reshuffling of administration, but mostly it was the same folks kind of just in different positions. And a lot of our uh, senior and executive level administration were completely on board with assessment. So uh, whatever I couldn't get them uh, to do, um, our, our provost and our, and our VP for student services were, were, were there to back me up. And um, that, that, that is a, a, a one of the bigger differences in, in getting the job done with assessment is having that uh, uh, support from, from the executive uh, level leadership. It makes such a huge difference and it's also so difficult to influence. Um, <laughs> sometimes that requires its own creativity. Uh, but I know just from working with Laredo, David, I've worked with you for many, many years. You've helped helped Weave make some important improvements to the software as well um, regarding a lot of these things. But I've always admired just the, the real atmosphere of teamwork that you all have when we see you at the conferences and whatnot too. It's not just a couple people, it's it's a big team that's really committed to this and that helps. I'm sure it doesn't happen overnight. Even the positive effects of that don't happen overnight, but uh, it, sometimes that patience, um, I, I think is one of the more challenging parts because you're doing the right things, but it can just take a little while for them to really show uh, the fruits of your labor for sure. Going to move on to our next topic, and this one will probably uh, be pretty interesting. Was there something that surprised you during all of this or something that was unexpected uh, that you think our audience would enjoy hearing about? And um, Joy, I'm going to ask you to go first, if that's okay. Sure. 
I think the, the biggest surprise that I had, um, and I kept reading over and over again in every conference that I, that I went to, I kept hearing, well, your faculty is going to resist this and your faculty is not going to want to do this and you're going to get pushback for this and you're, you know, how to, I kept hearing this term buy-in, which I absolutely despise that term now because it sort of implies that you're trying to get people to do something that they really, really don't want to do. Um, and you're sort of coercing them into doing it. Um, what surprised me after hearing all of that and having folks sort of tell me, you know, that, oh yeah, we gotta do that assessment stuff or when do we have to get that in? Um, really creating an environment where I am a resource for our faculty. I am here to help our faculty. And when it's presented as a, as a tool for them, instead of I'm here to create more work for you, uh, it becomes a completely different conversation. And I would encourage anybody who's starting out in this process to not assume that your faculty are going to be resistant to that process because they aren't always. And oftentimes, as it was at our college, all you had to do was really walk them through the process. Instead of it being a, here's something you're responsible for and this is when I need it back by, it's a, let me walk you through it, show you exactly what I need from you, and then how can I help you? Because you have goals, you have things you want to do. It's my job to help you document those things. That's my only purpose. And when it's presented as a, as a relationship and a, a resource for them, I, I think it becomes a completely different conversation. But don't assume, you know, everyone talks about how, you know, this assessment is such a bad word and nobody likes assessment. And listen, there are parts of our job that, that none of us really love. We do it because it's, it's a requirement. But when you can make that assessment a tool for them and how does it help them and let me show you what this can do in your in your classroom it becomes just a whole different experience so it really reframes the entire conversation and activity and I, I know you've shared with me a couple of stories just even specifically about well if we don't need to have this kind of meeting then let's not have it right. let's have one that matters and people really appreciate that. Um, so just those, just really being centered on, on what, what, what's going to help them because then it helps you in the long run too. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks Joy. Um, Matt. It's interesting. I find that my, my, uh, my responses and my experiences I'm drawing on really are uh, paralleling a lot of what Joy and David have said, I assume some of the people who are uh, attending the webinar would find the same thing. Um, it's ironic that what Joy said about the fact that other members of the leadership team turned out not to understand things because they had had such high turnover that lots of them were new in their positions is actually true or was actually true at my institution as well. She, she talked about that as being uh, one of the biggest challenges and I had that sort of lined up to talk about is what surprised me. You know, I, I got into this position and I thought, well, I'm new and I have a huge task ahead of me, but there are going to be other people who, uh, who probably uh, can lead me through it and, and, and I can bounce stuff off of them and so on. No, nope, I was actually a, kind of a, if not a one man band and then something close to it. And suddenly everyone was looking at me to know what to do in, in terms of questions about is this working or is that working or do we have a problem here or there? And uh, we had a lot of people who had been there a shorter time than I had uh, as, as far as total time at the institution. I remember one time we were having a, a pretty important meeting with the vice presidents and, and uh, directors and so on there. And it turned out that I, with about five years at the institution at that time, was the, the longest serving member of the college community. So, uh, I just hadn't taken that into account. I'm not, I mean, longest serving member, not of the whole college community, but of the people in that room. And I hadn't taken into account that I was going to have to crash course myself on a lot of things and then bring them up to speed. And that leads into something else that surprised me was that they really, really wanted to know about these accreditation uh, matters. And so did the uh, faculty and the rest of the staff when I, at our big, uh, opening of the year in service meeting I did a big presentation on it and then some others I got down to basics and I was 
showing a map of the SAC COC region, the states that it covers, and I was explaining what the acronym SAC COC stands for, and I was uh, going through just ground level, ground level things, uh, and let's let's make sure we all understand what institutional effectiveness means, and then kind of ratcheting it up from there. And um, afterwards, I had people telling me, you know, that's so awesome. Nobody ever took the time to explain those things before. This has always stood in the background, and it seems like you invoke the name of your accreditor when you just want to scare people into understanding why something is important. And I remember how I always hated it when the teachers, when I was in like K through 12 school, would do that. that they'd try and come up with something to scare you into doing your work. And I found out apparently people had felt that way at Ranger College about accreditation matters for some years. I had taught there and been uh, an associate VP there for a couple of years previously. So I kind of knew where SAC, COC, and accreditation stood. But I hadn't realized until I was in charge of it the extent to which it just kind of was this cloudy thing that th this thing that seemed threatening in the background. And I was presented with the opportunity to help overcome that. So that was not at all what I expected it would be part of my job. And, and I love that you took the opportunity to reframe it by starting at the very beginning um, and making the implicit explicit. Let's actually go back and talk about what this is and why we do it and why it's a good thing and how it helps us and how we're doing a lot of it anyway. But it's, it's kind of, we talk about this um, as faculty sometimes too, that when we're teaching a course, we can't know what we don't know. If we've taught physics for many years, some of those fundamentals, it's almost impossible for us to remember a time when we didn't know them. And I think that can happen a lot in, in accreditation and assessment too. We've been doing this for so long and we're part of this community and we think about this every day, but not everybody does. Um, so that's, I, I, I like that it was a surprise and that you figured out a, a good way to, to take advantage of it as an opportunity to, to educate your campus. That's great. And then that ground, that ground level stuff definitely helped then. And when it came down to the really specific technical work of the working with the vice president of instruction and others to um, fundamentally remake our assessment system for program learning outcomes and to fundamentally remake our institutional effectiveness system, you know, that background of sort of the theoretical and attitudinal understanding of it really played into then the specific work that had to be done to uh, make things right. It's very foundational. That's, I love that. And David? Well, I, I, I will piggyback a little bit on, on what Joy said. I think uh, one of uh, the biggest surprises was, uh, you know, not having to, to beg for that faculty buy-in or even staff. Um, we, we involved a lot of people in, in some of the day-to-day -day things, um, um, you know, conducting assessment or, or reporting on their assessment. But, um, you know, Looking at, uh, we just went through the the visit and, and the compliance certification. You know, we involved a lot of people in in throughout the course of that uh, year of getting ready for that. And I think that one of the biggest surprises is how grateful people were to be involved, um, because when you give them uh, that that sense of shared responsibility for accreditation, then um, the return on that is the the sense of shared accomplishment. Um, they all felt like they contributed to a, su a successful project. Um, again, however um, little it was, or how, you know, whatever role they played in that whole thing, uh, we we received a lot of, uh, you know, thank you for for getting me involved. Thank you for for letting us you know, kind of understand what what the process looks like and uh, how we could help and things like that. Right. Um, what one of the other uh, uh, sort of nice surprises is um, when, when we chose our quality enhancement plan, um, we chose it on, on digital learning and uh, moving more towards uh, using digital technology in the classroom um, and, and just putting that in the frame of what's going on now. It feels now like a little bit of a foreshadowing. Uh, we were already getting ready to push some of our um, in-class or, or in-class uh, material onto uh, a more digital format. Um, you know, we probably were a little bit more rushed into it than we would have liked, but uh, it, it, you know, it's a, it was a nice surprise to know that uh, 
we seem to have chosen the right uh, quality enhancement plan for our for our college, given um, th what's going on right now. Hopefully that's made this um, rather abrupt switch at least a little bit smoother for your institution. <laughs> that's it has, good. it has. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go on to our final topic. And then just for our audience, this will be the last one that, that was kind of set. And so if you have questions you're wanting to ask of the panelists, you'll be able to do that here in just a little bit. So feel free to be brainstorming your questions and we'll, we'll share those with the group. But I wanted to hear from the panelists one of your most important tips or pieces of advice for, for our audience. And I know you just spoke, David, but I'm going to give you a chance to go first this time. <laughs> Well, I, I probably won't say uh, a lot of things that that will surprise people, but uh, obviously start early. Uh, you know, don't. Uh, in fact, don't ever stop. You know, from from one uh, compliance report to another, don't, never stop doing some of the activities. But start writing early. That was a, a big key uh, for us. Uh, involve others, and I think I've talked a lot about that. Um, you know, throughout uh, some of the things I said, and. <clears throat> You know, one of the things we always try to make it fun. Um, I, I know sometimes with um, uh, you know one of our administration uh, administrators says that uh, assessment and IE are like uh, paying your taxes, and, and that's not what we want. The, the message we want to send to people. So, you know, when we have people over, we always try to you know incorporate some some fun little activities into um, into what we're uh, doing so that um, you know they don't feel so so much like this is a chore rather than something that they like to do right um but my number one advice for for anything that we do is, is to feed people right and fed people are always happy people and uh, we always try to uh, make our ie meetings feel more like um, like coffee breaks like uh, they come in they have some coffee or soda water you know, we always have a, a few snacks available for them. And, um, you know, they kind of get them out of their office into a different setting so that, um, you know, they kind of let their guard down and, and are able to work on, on the stuff that we need to uh, need them to work on. But, um, and, and as far as uh, the, the getting ready for uh, compliance and, and the visit, uh, I, I think one of the more valuable things that I did personally is I served as an observer on a committee visit about a year before our own committee came in and that was uh, that experience was uh, invaluable I mean it, it I, I brought a lot of a lot of the things that I learned from serving as an observer into our uh, into our own visit and I think that made a, a big a huge difference in how successful we were that's a, I've, that's a really good piece of advice and one I don't think I've heard a lot, but it would be so valuable to, to watch all of the, the pieces that you wouldn't be aware of otherwise, um, because it's pretty detailed and, and of course every campus is different, but that's a, that's a really good one. And I, agree, I completely agree with you. Food is a wonderful way to make us all happy. <laughs> Coffee, donuts, lunch, all of those are, uh, it, it, it it's just a nice way to be together and uh, not work on an empty stomach or under caffeinated. <laughs> That's a good one too. Um, Matt? Well, earlier in my response to the first question, when I was sort of giving background on our recent accreditation challenges at Ranger College, I mentioned uh, being brutally honest. And uh, although I don't know if you have to take the brutal part in, I feel like my most important a tip or advice from my own experience would be to be that way. I guess brutally honest is a is a good way to is a good way to phrase it. And I mean both internally and externally. Uh, internally, in terms of how you uh, are looking at your own institution, what you're seeing in your own institution, how you're understanding it, how you're communicating about it with your people, and also how you are communicating it uh, outward to your accrediting body. Um, it doesn't mean you have to necessarily take a negative view, but I did learn that trying to, um, trying to make it look like things are sweeter than they are, you know, trying to uh, 
paint everything with rosy colors is certainly one of the best ways to both impede improvement on the inside and to uh, invite really uh, negative responses on the outside. You know, uh, with with SACS, the, no, the the first principle of accreditation in their in their list is uh, the principle of integrity. The institution operates with integrity in uh, all matters. Well, we actually got commended for the the very self-critical write-up that we did on ourselves that I, I wrote most of the text of, although some of our division chairs did as well, wrote some of it for uh, how we were failing to live up to what we had said we were doing with the assessment of learning outcomes for our educational programs. We had other self-critical areas that we talked about. And I found that during, not just, not just when it seemed like we had a real sky is falling moment coming on us with that fifth year report, but when we found out that there were other malfunctioning systems we weren't asked to report on for that report that we needed to fix, this sort of energy and identity almost of like a prophet was taking hold of me and I would be in our administrative council meetings and that sort of, sort of, in a way, pounding the drums of doom, you know, trying to make people understand. And it was just kind of coming through me like, this is serious, people. Uh, not that we're going to die, but, you know, this is something that we cannot let slide. Do you realize what's happening here? And uh, it seemed like it was bracing to everyone and was bracing to me as well. It's not that that's the only way to go, but for us, it was a, a sort of a dose of real talk seemed to be necessary. And as I say, when we wrote up things pretty transparently, describing the problems that we had found with ourselves, when we were putting together the narratives for a compliance certification, we did the right thing. And I had received some advice about that from people at the uh, big meetings that I was going to in Atlanta and elsewhere throughout the year. And um, it, was, it was an education to me to find out that, uh, that uh, no, you don't have to do uh, sort of paper over things and try, and try and put a happy face on them. And I don't know how many other metaphors I could use for that. Just describe what's real and use that very self-realization to be coming up with real ways that you are addressing and fixing the situation. And then also describe that as well, and what you're reporting to your accreditor. That formula was described to me by three or four different people at three or four different meetings. We used it for us and it worked out quite well. I find that refreshing to hear, honestly, and it's, it's something that um, I know many of you and, and people um, in the audience as well have either um, assisted in training faculty and staff on doing the assessment piece or been the recipient of said training. I've been on both sides as well. And um, it, it can be scary where we think, okay, well, I, I have to make sure that all of my students meet this target at 100% and, or, or we're all going to be in big trouble. Well, no, we really do want to know how we're doing. And if there's room for improvement, then we'll make a plan for that. It's that very genuine desire to, to improve and have it be the best that it can be eventually. It doesn't mean that, uh, that we have to be disingenuous about that. So I, I really, I like that tip a lot. That was great. And Joy? I have two things that, that I would recommend. And, and the first is that um, being a person that was, that was new to this process, I was not only new at my college, but I was, I was new to this area as well. Um, and I think I was a bit intimidated by that, just knowing that, um, you know, the, the more I went into it, the more I realized I didn't know and, and, you know, I would attend more trainings and, oh, there are other things I need to know. Um, it can leave you feeling, I guess, a little, um, I don't want to say unprepared, but it can leave you feeling a little bit um, lacking, I guess. And the one thing that, that I really want to, um, I guess, enforce or, or make clear is that what you do in assessment is really, really, really important. Um, the way that you talk about it um, should be in a way that, that really conveys that it matters, that what you're doing matters, not because, you know, the big eye in the sky, SAC COC is saying you have to, um, but because it, it matters in all fronts of education, that assessment is really vitally important. You, you have to realize at the same time that it is never going to be the most important thing to your staff or your faculty. 
Um, it is important. It, it may be a huge part of your universe, but for them, it, it is another piece of what they do. Um, but don't ever take away from, from what you're doing in, a, in assessment as a college or as a department because it, the way that you talk about it really matters and it really sets the tone for how people perceive the entire process. Um, so be confident in that. Be confident in what you're telling people. It doesn't mean you know everything. It just means that you, you know why you're doing it. And I think that that's really important as you, as you present it to other people, as you present it you know, to your faculty and your staff. And then the other thing is that, and this is equally as important, I think that remembering that, that the relationships are paramount to accomplishing what you need to will take you extremely far. If you, every conversation you have is focused on the relationship with that department chair, with that division director, uh, you're going to have just a, a much better experience with them. They're, they're going to trust you. You're going to be able to ask them to do things that maybe they would have been resistant to before. Um, but that always go in with that relationship in mind, not how do I convince this person to do something that they don't want to do? That's, it's just not a, just do away with that mindset because it will, it will impede you and your progress. But those, those are the two things I have to remind myself of on a regular basis. Those were all really good tips. Um, then again, they were all unique in, in a lot of ways too. I think those relationships are really important and it relates back to kind of a theme we're hearing that how you, how we talk about this and how we present it and how people perceive it and perceive our our feelings about it are, are really important foundational things to get all of this started. So thank you all so much. And we have some questions that have come in. I'm so excited about these. I'm going to, uh, I actually put these into a slide. I, I'm the type of learner where I do better when I can read it. So I want to make sure I'm uh, accommodating that for other people who learn like I do. And so I'm just going to go through these and then you can either all take a turn to answer or we can kind of pass them around if you if you all have something to say. Um, the first one, based on your SAC COC experience in reference to standard 10.9 cooperative academic agreement, does dual enrollment and articulation agreements fall under this standard? Also, what are some other agreements that would fall under this standard? Um, is there anybody who wants to volunteer to tackle that one? I'll take that question. Thanks, David. Um, I'm familiar with uh, standard 10.9 only because, uh, you know, having written the compliance certification uh, in the last year, this is one of the agreements I had to, or this is one of the standards where uh, we, we did get some feedback on. Um, I'll tell you that we did not include dual enrollment um, with, uh, with uh, standard 10.9 simply because uh, when, when we went back and looked at the, the hiring procedures for dual enrollment, um, e even when the faculty uh, belongs to the high school and, and they're teaching dual enrollment classes, they have to go through our hiring process to do that. So uh, because of that, we consider them our, our own adjuncts and, and therefore not under 10.9. What we did include in this standard was an agreement that we had with the Virtual College of Texas. So, so there's a, a, an agreement where students can take uh, courses online and the faculty are not our own, but we give them uh, credit. So we, we did include that, um, that agreement with them. <clears throat> I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that, that has been my experience. Uh, David's answer corresponds to what I would have said. We, we at Ranger College, we have a, a total enrollment of about 24, 2,500, and just over 50% of that is from uh, dual credit partner schools. So we have a, like 40 something partner schools. It's really a huge operation. And uh, we have never counted that under 10.9 um, for the same reasons he said. With hiring, those are those are instructors working for us teaching our classes, so it doesn't actually amount to some sort of consortial agreement. We have an agreement with the high schools, but not not uh, the type that would fall under 10.9. I don't think articulation agreements would necessarily fall under 10.9 because you're pretty much, uh, at least in the way that I conceive of them and we've practiced them, you're not talking about offering um, some sort of uh, joint degree or something like that with other, another institution. You're just talking about the uh, smooth handoff and acceptance of certain credits transferring. So that's 
That's the way I see that. I was not involved in that section, so I have nothing of value to offer. Sorry. Well, we'll let you answer some of the other ones. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. our, no, that's all right. Thank you, uh, David and Matt. I would not have been able to answer that one either. So, um, second question What is the single most effective practice your team employed when gathering and organizing your evidence from all corners of the institution for accreditation visits? This is a good one. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that Weave is obviously your your best tool to to use for that, but um, you know, really understanding what it is that those departments are trying to do helps you to give them ideas of what you need from them. So if if they have a goal and the measure is you know X Y and Z, what can you sort of ask of them, and, and I did a lot of this via email or, or even on the phone saying, hey, do you have an agenda from that meeting? Would you mind sending it to me? Do you have something in email form? And really just making it easy on them. Uh, and you know, I guess you can take the attitude that, well, it's really not my job to upload their documentation. Um, that's not gonna help you. Uh, but making it easy for them, because sometimes they don't really understand that the, the notes that they made, the agenda that they put together, that all of those things are documentation, that all of those things are, are evidence, and um, you want those things from them. So really sort of facilitating that, I guess, would be my, my, my best advice is, is to make suggestions for, for what's appropriate for what they're trying to do. I like that. Um, it's sometimes tempting to include all the pieces of evidence rather than the ones that demonstrate something most specifically. So by starting with the questions you just mentioned, that would really help get at that as well. But I wanna give David and Matt a chance to respond too, sorry. <laughs> I'll add that, um, you know, I'll, I'll say a few things. Uh, first of all, Weave uh, was our central repository for anything uh, assessment related. Uh, and there's a, a a lot of our, our compliance items that, that were assessment related and we use we for, for all of that. Um, for, for the other standards that didn't involve uh, assessment or we we created a, a um, in within our institution. So kind of like a, an internal cloud uh, based storage and uh, we had uh, folders in there for every single standard. And as uh, folks were submitting or were being asked to submit, we asked them all to just uh, dump things in there. And then we sorted them out uh, later. But um, I think that worked quite, a, quite effectively to, to help us sort of uh, give everybody an opportunity to, to upload their own documentation. And then uh, kind of the last thing I'll say is that the last, um, I would say eight to six months before we submitted our compliance, we took over a computer lab, uh, which became sort of the central uh, location for accreditation. And uh, everyone knew that if they had to turn something in or, or if they had to submit something for uh, compliance related, they knew that they could find somebody there uh, that they could submit to or, um, get help on how to submit or what exactly to submit. But those are some of the things that we did that were uh, very effective in making sure that we had all the documentation we needed uh, for our compliance. Ranger College, ours is uh, pretty, pretty simple. The advice I would offer, we have a compliance certification committee as a standing committee that becomes activated in the lead up to, uh, to uh, a compliance certification becoming due and to accreditation visits happening. And it's made up of, as you would expect, a representative sample of people from places of uh, supervision and also people who are just sort of representatives of various aspects of every part of the institution. And we had uh, frequent meetings and uh, very carefully delegated, uh, very carefully delegated things to the different people to their different areas and just kept extreme track of what they were sending to us. We didn't create a central drive as some kind of repository. It was more like my email inbox became the uh, the, the central repository. We we're going to work out something like David described in, in the future for the next time. We're actually beginning work on our on our ten year compliance certification right now for a decennial reaffirmation. But just having the frequent meetings and making sure that we kept track of who was going out into the wild 
to collect these things and then coming back together to parse those things together so that it was a distributed activity with representation from all parts of the institution that came back together in some kind of coherent way to make sense of it all was, uh, was our most effective practice. The word overwhelming comes to mind. Um, it's, it's a lot of different pieces of evidence, uh, but those are all really good pieces of advice as well. Um, this question may be specific, I think, too. I think it was David that had mentioned these, but if not, um, we can have the right person answer it. Did you have a kickoff of some sort for your IE Tuesdays? How did you launch those? Well, you know, I would like to say yes, that it was a big party, you know, big kickoff party to to launch IE Tuesdays. But the truth is, it kind of, it kind of morphed from something small. I think I started meeting with a, a very small group of, of department chairs, and, and I think at that time it was a college readiness division, and then it moved into, well, the arts and sciences uh, department chairs also wanted to have a similar meeting, and then the workforce chairs wanted to have it. So, um, you know, we started off with a small group of chairs. So, you know, like I said, now uh, IE Tuesdays involve. Um, directors and from from every corner of the college you know we start off mornings with uh, the student services and the uh, administration and then we meet uh, all afternoon with uh, our academic folks and and but uh no no real kickoff it you know kind of it kind of became ie tuesdays and, and now it's kind of known uh, everybody knows that the last tuesday of every month is is ie tuesday I like that though, that it started out smaller, probably more manageable. And then again, it's, it can be hard to be patient, but sometimes those things really pay off in ways we don't anticipate as well. Um, so there's, I've heard of institutions doing um, brown bag lunches or when there's a webinar, they'll all watch it in one, one room with their lunches and the department will buy cookies or whatever. Again, the food is, uh, <laughs> the food can be important, right? Uh, but that's, it's a good time to ask questions and, and get together as well. Our next question, how do you think assessment will be impacted this academic year, given the closing of campuses and going to online learning? Anybody want to tackle that one first? I, this is a good question, too. I think it changes how we do it. I don't think it changes what we do. Um, I, in fact, during the, the first week that I was uh, working from home, that was the week that I sent a lot of feedback about our ongoing assessment reports and sent it to the faculty and um, you know just sort of um, and to our departments and just sort of said you know I, I know we have a lot going on I just uh, wanted to give you some feedback and um, you know especially given the current circumstance I think you have to be even more vigilant about it because now is the time when things will fall off of, of their schedule and I think sort of adhering to whatever assessment plan you've created um, and whatever deadlines and whatever dates, you may have to change exactly how you're doing it. Um, but I don't think that those, that those things change. Um, I've had to have the conversation um, with quite a few of our departments that, you know, cause they say, well, but I can't do the things that I was going to do because this closed and because there are no students here. And that is perfectly acceptable. And that's why we talk about that whole continuous improvement. Um, we're seeking continuous improvement. We didn't get there and this is why and and just sort of reassuring them that that is perfectly okay that that this is the kind of thing that happens, but it is okay. Um, and so going back to what I said at first, I think it changes how we do it. It doesn't necessarily change what we do. I agree with Joy. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, the THECB, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, has a very good COVID-19 FAQ up on their website now. And they uh, asked the question at one point, um, will uh, we still have so something along the lines of, do we still have to do, uh, have, have student evaluations of instructors? And they offer an explanation of why uh, it could well be the case that uh, results from those kinds of evaluations uh, might not actually reflect reality, might be impacted just by the nature of the disruption that has happened with the sudden move to online for all of us. Uh, I would say that I think uh, 
it's possible that some assessment results might be impacted along the exact same line, both from the student end and from the instructor end, because a huge number of instructors who haven't been accustomed or never even intended or thought that they would uh, be teaching online are doing so now. So I think we're maybe going to have to allow for the fact that, uh, or for the possibility that assessment results may be anomalous for this semester and for any future semesters that are impacted in this way, because we're all just now getting accustomed to this situation that's changing as we speak. Yep. And I'll just add um, that, that we're, what we're telling our folks to do is uh, not, not to change anything. The deadlines are, are, are still the same. They still have to submit their assessment reporting query. This um, new sort of reality will might might kick in might be in the analysis of the results, kind of like what uh, Matt and Joy said. So we're letting them know that you know if those assessment results seems a little bit different than normal, uh, to to make sure we we include that in 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 uh, the findings and the analysis of of our uh, results uh, when when we upload all that stuff into Weave. And I just wanted to mention as well that we had a shout out in the chat uh, for thank you for including student services and student affairs in that in that response. I think that is uh, probably very, very disruptive to those groups moving that kind of thing online and developing new resources that didn't need to be there before a lot of really creative, uh, talented people over there trying to make that work. So um, yeah, yeah, big shout out to those people and thanks for mentioning it. Uh, I also wanted to mention, I'm going to send something in the chat just quickly. Um, Niloa is doing a, a webinar every Thursday on this topic. In fact, it just started a moment ago. Um, so I put the link in the chat to everybody if you want to go to those and it's going to be kind of a, I guess maybe the right way would, to describe it would be kind of a town hall where they're going to be talking about these exact types of issues. So I'm sure you can sign up and, and get approved um, enough to get in there today. But I think they're going to do it for several Thursdays in a row. And Sherry, if you want to speak up for a moment and correct anything I misspoke on, feel free to. And then there's also a group, um, AALHE is also started a, a group in Slack um, that you can join and have a conversation there that's not as in person. So I'll put the link to that there as well. And um, I know we're a little bit over and I think we kind of talked a little bit about this last question earlier about how we've had facilitated the evidence gathering. Um, as many of you probably know, we have areas for all of those things uh, to help streamline a lot of this work. And if you ever have questions about that, please just let us know. We would be more than happy to help you with, the, with those things. But all three of our institutions today have been successfully using Weave to navigate some of this work. Um, and they also have a lot of experience doing the, the other outside of the software pieces. And I just want to sincerely thank them for their time today. This was, I learned a lot and uh, it was nice to get to connect with everyone. I know that uh, many of us are missing that face-to-face -face time that we would have had in our offices. So it was really nice to hear other voices and hear perspectives on this and also talk about this very um, hot topic right now of how we're tackling all of these things. So. Also, thank you to all of you for hanging out with us for an hour. It was wonderful to get to share with you and hear some of your questions. There will be a survey that comes up when you leave. Um, we've assessed this too. We want to continuously improve our offerings. So if you have a moment that's really short, if you would have a moment to do that, we'd really appreciate it. We will be sending out an email with a link to the recording to this session. You feel free to share it with others. And we do also have a knowledge center um, I'm going to just pull that up really quickly. Our website is weaveducation.com and you can navigate over to Knowledge Center. And here there's a lot of free resources. So here's the panel. We always put our webinars here at the top, but we have sheets, um, articles, guides, um, on-demand webinars, and all of this is free. It's available to everybody. 
everybody here at Weave has done this work on a campus. Um, I was the assistant director of assessment at, at a Texas institution. Um, most of my colleagues are Sherry was was also, and we really are committed, especially during this turbulent time, to providing you all with with free resources that you can use to do this important work. So feel free to check out our knowledge center. Um, we would love to have your feedback on those items as well. And our next webinar um, is going. We have two webinars coming up in April. One is about the critical thinking assessment test for general education assessment and we're also having one on um, dual enrollment so that'll be really interesting as well if you signed up for this one you'll get emails about those again my name is amber thank you so much for all your time today especially since we went a little bit over thank you again to brian and sherry for helping me manage all this and then of course a huge thank you to our our panelists today really, really appreciate David, Matt, and Joy's time and expertise, and I hope we didn't torture you too bad and that you had an okay time as well. Definitely. Wonderful. Definitely. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Thank you all so much, and um, if you have other questions, feel free to email us and we can put you in touch with the panelists as well. Thank you all, and everybody have a great rest of the week. Hang in there. Bye. <laughs>